So um, just before we start off, I mean, I've already started recording, so I'm just going to kind of <laughs> flow into the conversation. I won't be too formal with it. But um, um, just to start off, perhaps you could just um, let me know how, how things are. Because obviously you used to be with Flagship Freedom. Mm-hmm. Um, and so anybody that's listening to this, I encourage them to check out Flagship Freedom, even though you're not still producing content. There's a lot of great content that you've already produced in the past on there. Um, some great conversations with people like Walter Block and uh, Jeffrey Tucker and uh, and myself. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so I encourage anyone to look at that. But you've also got a, a new project in the works um, that's coming along the horizon. Did you want to just sort of speak about that briefly? Sure. Well, thank you for the kind words, Matt. You give me a lot of credit, maybe a little too much. Um, well, yeah, you're right. This I had a project called Flagship Freedom for a while. And, you know, what I determined after kind of doing it in sort of a, a half-hearted way is that I want to do, I want to create a platform that that I'm completely proud of and not something that I'm just kind of rushing to produce content. And that's the reason it's been on hold for a while. Uh, is I've really focused quite a lot on my career and family now. And if I'm going to basically pursue my light, one of my life's passions, which is promoting voluntarism, I don't want it to be just another podcast producing cobwebs in the corner. Like that's depressing and that's not giving the message the, oh, what's the word? It's, it, it's not giving it the attention that it really deserves. So, you know, I, I'm not so sure when that's going to happen, so don't hold your breath or anything. It's something that deserves attention and funding in real time. It's not something I have an abundance of right now at the moment. So that that's I'm sort of uh, patiently plotting over here in the background while I take care of some other things in life. Even though voluntarism is urgent and, and incredibly important, uh, you know I'm I can't just put my family and career life on hold as much as. <laughs> As much as we'd all love to pursue our passions completely, there is uh, you know, those other parts of life as well. Yeah, and no, I understand that. Uh, you know, the same problem, and a lot of people in the same boat. We have our family commitments and our work commitments. I'd much rather do uh, talking about voluntarism as my full time job uh, rather than the job I have. But you know, needs must, and you know, we've all got families to provide for, and uh, I think it's a common problem that people have engaging in you know whether it's voluntarism or just you know whether they're just sort of engaging in political discourse and and and, and making themselves aware of, of things that are happening i think it's difficult for everybody to to varying extents because you know we've all got family commitments and there's only so many hours in the day and there's only so many things you can focus your mind on and and of course you've got to prioritize and uh, especially when you've got a family to look after so um i'm you know without any well, there's no timetable on when it comes out but i'm i'm personally looking forward to it when it does come out so i'm sure it'll be a great show like i said i did enjoy flagship freedom i can understand why you want to um uh, come back with something uh, that little bit more uh, a little polished. more refined yeah yeah a little bit more refined i can certainly understand that but i did enjoy i did enjoy the flagship freedom podcast and as i say anyone who's listening to this i should should go check them out because some great conversations on there so thank you um right so um any also anybody um we had a conversation on your flagship freedom which i'll put a link to to, to the flagship freedom um website and also a link to that specific conversation that we had in the past where um you kindly had me on your show and i was able to sort of speak about nations of sanity and introduce the concept and just very briefly for anybody that's listening here that doesn't already know what nations of sanity is about um it's basically the concept behind that is to try to um actually create a free society um we assert that the only way to create a free society and the only way to define a free society is to establish the non-aggression principle as the law uh through a peace agreement basically making it the terms of peace um and that's made up of a three-part agreement which is part one's the basic agreement part two is the lines in the sand which is like the limits of tolerance just adding that extra clarity to the non-aggression principle and part three is rightful ownership when i spoke to you before it was a four-part agreement but i realized that one of those parts was actually kind of redundant um and not necessary and uh, the sim the simpler you can make things like this i think the better it is for people to digest so i was able to reduce it down to a three-part agreement but that is the three parts i think that would be needed to establish the non-aggression principle 
um you know in the real world so everybody kind of you know not just know because i think if you the part one part of it is just agreeing to what the non-aggression principle is but like i say these these gray areas need a little bit of refinement so people know where the lines are drawn you know where they can't step any further to the point mm -hmm. that they're actually uh, violating the non-aggression principle so um so yeah so that's what nations of sanity is about and you know um when it comes to the issue of voluntarism, um, which is kind of, again, for anyone listening to this, that's the ideology that basically representing uh, voluntarism. It's kind of like anarchism. It's basically the idea that only voluntary interactions are valid. Um, and it's based on the premise of self-ownership and the non-aggression principle, which is built on that premise. We all own ourselves and we all have right and power over only ourselves. And we don't have the right to interfere or violate others. And, uh, I think that's something that strikes at most people's moral centre, but uh, obviously it's encapsulated in the non-aggression principle in a more intellectual way. And I think that's the principle that we need to build our society on. But um, with that in mind, I just wanted, uh, I think a good thing to talk about now would be the continuum problem, because um, that's obviously something that part two of my little peace agreement looks to um, deal with. And it's a, it's an issue that a lot of people that sort of speak about anarchism, voluntarism and libertarianism don't always address. Um, the, the, the term continuum problem is something I heard Walter Block mention when he was talking about things like, I mean, the example he gave is like age of consent. You know, it's, it's mm. perfectly acceptable for you to, um, you know, to have consensual sexual relationships with a, a 30 year old, for example, um, but not with a six year old. And obviously the reasons for that are very obvious in regards to a child not being able to consent. Um, so the, you know, the, the, the black and white of where one side sits and where the other side sits very obvious, but the continuum problem describes the fact that there isn't necessarily an objective point where one becomes the other and there is a kind of gray area from when a child becomes an adult and it's not the only example of a continuum problem another example i sort of talk about is you know i could i could swing my fists in your general direction if i'm standing 100 feet away from you and i'm obviously not aggressing against you in any way if i was six inches from your face and i was doing that that would obviously be threatening behavior um so you know there's lots of different things it doesn't i mean child can uh, age of consent is a more obvious area and certainly a very serious area that needs to be addressed but there's kind of a lot of areas where um the continuum problem does kind of show its face and although the non-aggression principle itself is an objective principle that defines morality in a kind of objective and universal way this continuum issue does arise and show that there is these kind of fuzzy edges in certain areas that needs to be addressed yeah, yeah, exactly. And the longer you think about these things or really any philosophy regarding human experience and human society, you realize that it's not, you know, black and white. It rarely is black and white. But um, it's it's kind of annoying to me that people always have to cite, it feels like they always have to cite gray areas as a way to try to discredit a philosophy. Like there's this online uh joke you know running against and caps like well what if the child consents though as if like and caps are all <laughs> like pedophiles or something it's like maybe there's like one or two people who who asked a legitimate question of what is the age of consent you're absolutely right is that it it's a transitioning thing and that doesn't mean like that's just a fact of life and um it, unfortunately, there are some areas of life where this transition phase is extremely long, right? Like the, the transition from, let's say, 0 to 18, well, that's 18 years. Now, most other areas of life, um, we don't really have these issues. It's pretty well established. Like, for example, you don't have, humans don't really have much of a need to swing their fists around constantly. So, so we don't have this continuum problem of like, people constantly getting punched in the face by accident, right? <laughs> Things like that. So yes, it is true. Like you can, you can identify this problem in all sorts of areas. Uh, pollution would definitely be one of them, right? Like how much pollution is acceptable, uh, things that are very hard to track, uh, you know, versus like murdering somebody is a very black and white thing. You either killed them or you didn't kill them. Whereas pollution is like, well, how much did you harm another person? And 
I don't think it's a way to discredit any particular philosophy because they all suffer from this sort of thing at the end of the day. It's just something you have to be aware of and try and basically try to set up a, a sane, reasonable system. That this is it really takes just being reasonable. And we're really not competing for what's a perfect philosophy. And that's something I found myself getting caught up in uh over and over was like I identified these weaknesses in voluntarism or proper uh, propertarianism, and then I, I had to remind myself, look, dude, no social system is perfect. We're not trying to find what's perfect. We're trying to find what is less wrong. And I, I discovered that as a principle. I think there's a podcast out there called Less Wrong. But we're, we're all just trying to find the best system, not the perfect system. And that's, that's something you know that people hold us to a standard of perfection. Meanwhile, just look at you know the state, look at the government, look at communism. Uh, these systems are not only far from perfect, they're horrendous. So it doesn't bother me too much now as I've gained a little bit of wisdom in my life. You know, I have a child of my own. I realize he doesn't have the ability to make good decisions for himself uh, all the time. In fact, most of the time, he's only one and a half years old right now. So yes, I do have to carry him around against his will sometimes. Sometimes I have to impose my will and, you know, not let him eat what he wants to eat all the time. And that's okay. You know, adults, people who have a good, well-rounded uh, worldview, and th those people are reasonable and those people will usually never have problems in these gray areas. So it, it's, a, it's something to be aware of, but not something to despair over. Definitely, I definitely agree, and, and it's important as well. I mean, one of the um, articles on my website that sort of touches on the continuum um, issue, that doesn't call it the continuum issue, because um, that's something I heard from all the block, and I think it's a good way of describing it. Um, but one of the sort of metaphors I used in one of my articles was, and I think I might have spoke about this when we spoke before, um, was called Where the Desert Meets the Grassland. Um, and it was kind of using a kind of geographical representation of what we're talking about by sort of saying, right, you've got the desert and you've got the grassland and then you've got this area where one slowly becomes the other. That's like a little bit harder to define this sort of in between area. Um, and the point about that is it doesn't change the fact that the desert is the desert. And the grassland exactly. is the grassland. The fact that you've got this kind of little in-between area where you're not quite sure exactly where one becomes the other. And, you know, reasonable people could debate, oh, well, actually, you know, this is where it starts because this is where there's no more grass and it's only sand and, you know, things like that. But when you're standing in the middle of the desert, there's no question, you know, and there's only sand around you, you're in the desert. And likewise, if you're standing in the middle of grassland and there's nothing but grass around you, you're in the grassland. And... Uh, and the reason why I kind of you invoke that is because it's it's reminding people that the the, the dichotomy that that you describe with something that's a violation of non-aggression principle and something that's not that isn't invalidated by the potential fuzziness of the line in between. You know, you've still got that dichotomy. You've still got the desert being the desert and the grassland being the grassland. And the fact that you've got this in-between area that's harder to define doesn't change the fact that you've got those two distinct opposites. Um, and likewise, uh, I mean, just touching on, on sort of age of consent thing, you know, when it comes to that, it's, it's really about the meaning of consent. And we understand that consent requires an understanding of what you're consenting to. And we basically define children and adults by their capacity to understand and um, take self-ownership of themselves. And we understand that a child is still developing, is still learning about the world, still understanding concepts. And while they're going through that development stage, there's a lot of things that they simply aren't able to consent to because they don't understand it properly. They don't understand it to that sufficient degree. And this is a kind of standard that we kind of already recognize in the modern world because, you know, even in the modern world, children can't consent to legal contracts. And obviously, you know, things like sex and drugs and stuff like that are, are, are a give me. But, we, you know, we understand that children can't consent to these things. But also in contract law, it's understood why. It's, it's understood that, I mean, even when you're coming out of children, even when you're dealing with adults, contract law sort of dictates that both parties understand. And it's one of the reasons why um, one of the things that's been put into contract law is whenever there's any ambiguity over a particular point in a contract, the benefit of that ambiguity always has to fall on the person that didn't draw up the contract. 
um, to sort of guard against, um, you know, um, you know, dishonest practices where people are trying to get tricked into things and stuff like that. So I think to a certain extent, this is something that's obviously recognised in society. That, just like a lot of things about the non-aggression principle are recognised in society today. Um, just it's just not applied, obviously, consistently. Um, and another point that I think is worth mentioning when it comes to the issue of children and, and, and our roles as parents or guardians for them and this is coming on to another subject which is the area of implicit contract because you might talk about the fact that well you know there's a lot of times you have to override the will of your child your child might want to do something that's potentially dangerous or harmful and as their parent or guardian who's taken the responsibility to look after them you obviously will override that um but i don't kind of view that as necessarily um violating their will because as i say they're not at a stage where they can truly understand you know a lot of the choices they make and this is where the implicit contract comes into it because um like i've often had and although again it's a bit of a ridiculous thing on the face of it but it's a good way of exploring the principle we often have people talk about saying well is it a violation to even bring a child into this world because you're obviously doing so against their will <laughs> right uh, and although that might seem facetious on the face of it there is a certain um validity to the point that's being raised which allows for an explanation on the area of implicit contract because this is where implicit contract comes in it's 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 reasonable to assume when 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 you have a being that can't confirm their own sort of consent they can't you know tell you a, your child can't tell you ahead of time that they want to be born and brought into this world but it's reasonable to assume and this is what I mean by implicit contract, it's reasonable to assume that your child would want to be brought into this world, that would mm -hmm. that would choose existence over non-existence if that choice was presented to them. And obviously, you know, in the absence of them having the power to make that choice, you make that choice for them. But that's part of being a parent or a guardian is you're making choices for them, but you're making choices that it would be reasonable to assume they would make themselves... Um, you know, if they had that that sort of the power to do so and the understanding to do so, and that's why the decisions that parents and guardians have to make um, for their children is ones that are for their benefit, and that's why um, you know we have we have we have a sort of uh, a, a control over them, but it's not a control that can extend to harming them. It's a control that can only be exercised in their interest. Something mm -hmm. that we know that when they come of age, now again people could pick holes of this and say well there's things that i still don't agree with about my childhood you know when i've grown up but unless it's in the again this is that desert grassland thing unless you're stepping into a kind of real black and white area of actual abuse it's it's you know again it's it's reasonable for people for, for people to not be psychic and know exactly what their children would wish for down to every little precise detail but as long as you're making a reasonable effort to act in their best interests um you know, uh, that, and again, this is where this is where that um, strive for perfection can cripple us a little bit. And we do have to step back and sort of say, you know, sometimes it's about being rational. Um, and when it comes to these kind of murky areas and these dividing lines, it's about being rational over things. And, you know, you, you can pick holes out of things till the end of time to a certain extent. It's important not to get too bogged down in that kind of thing. Um, but I think that's a good guide for people when people because because it's because the, the important thing about the question, although it might seem facetious about, oh, you know, what if the child consents in many, but it does strike to an important issue that needs to be addressed where people need to understand what consent means. And then they understand why a child can't consent and why, as a parent or guardian, you have the power to consent for them, but within the limits of it being for their benefit and qualifying under that area of implicit, implicit contrast sorry implicit contract where a right reasonable and rational person could assume that would be their choice if they could make it does that make sense oh yeah of course and i guess i'll just say one more thing on the topic of gray areas with a concrete example so like the more well i'll start with the abstract here real quick the 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 more that society is existing in gray areas well that's worse you want it to be as much black and white as possible just for the sake of simplicity, obviously. So an example of that would be looking at the absurdity of, let's say, like, 
uh, ethno-nationalism, right, or like white nationalism, or any any race. By now, the world is so mixed, and people's genes are so mixed that. Like probably a great majority of people have a little bit of everything in them. So if you had some absurd rule or law that said like that force can be used against people based on the their racial genetic makeup, then you're dealing with your now it's like, okay, well half the people are more in the world. It's not even clear what they are and what do you do with mixed people? Like they fall squarely into that category of neither this nor that. So that's why, for example, a principle like individualism uh, and self-ownership and, and ownership only of your actions and not, you know, ascribing blame or merit to somebody based on uh, collective uh, or b based on being part of a group, right? That's why individualism makes so much more sense than collectivism is because it's way more cut and dry. It's like, it's a lot easier to say, you know, your rights and your property and your right to be in a certain area uh, or your right to be treated a certain way just comes from you being an individual and not from like how what percentage of your racial genetic makeup uh you know falls into some some arbitrary category so individualism is so much more simple uh, rather than collectivism. And I would argue, likewise, that voluntarism is a lot more um, cut and dry and black and white than something like statism or the various flavors of statism. So it's really funny that people have all these complaints about, you know, a free society, whereas if we were able to, to implement, you know, the basic tenets of a free society, like respect for individual rights, uh, respect for property, and the non-aggression principle, really those two things, property and the non-aggression principle. If we could just take care of those two areas, you know, taxation is theft, then it would be so easy to deal with the gray areas com compared to what we have now, which is, you know, an absolute and complete mess. The idea that the entire country has a right to decide on, you know, what I do with my time or money or what someone puts in their body. Right now we, we are living in the, in a sea of gray area. And it, it's like, you know, the kettle calling the pot black or whatever that analogy is. So anyways, I think we've both kind of hammered this one. And uh, yeah, gray areas, it, it's not a problem that's unique or even, you know, very challenging to voluntarism compared to any other philosophy. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, one of the things I, I, I love about the non-aggression principle, and I mean, because obviously it's built on that premise of self-ownership. And, you know, it's a principle that, that cuts straight through nonsense like racism and stuff because, you know, it doesn't matter. You're an individual. It doesn't matter what your, you know, your race or nationality or any other kind of description or category people want to put themselves into. Um, I mean, you do also raise another good point about the, why the whole racism thing is absurd. Um, you know, we are all one species. And even where people want to draw racial distinctions, as you said yourself, so many of us are such a wide-ranging mixture um, I think a lot of people are starting to realize this as they do things like DNA tests and stuff that are becoming quite popular. Um, there was a YouTube video that um, went viral uh, relatively recently of um, this YouTuber. Um, she was a young black woman who was very much an identitarian, very kind of mm, right. um, connect connected to her racial identity. And she'd done a, um, an ancestry thing because she wanted to find out what tribe of in, in Africa she was a part of. Right. And she wanted to do it through her, her maternal line because that's where you get the mitochondria DNA is only inherited through your mother. Um, so um, that's how, like, you know, the, the test was done. Anyway, when she got the results back, she found out that her maternal heritage was European. Um, and she was a little <laughs> bit devastated by it. And a lot of people online have mocked her for it, which you know, perhaps a little bit unfair. Uh, but it does kind of show how silly her racial identitarianism is um because there was you know you know she 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 thought she was completely black she looked uh like a black lady and her immediate family were all black people so she didn't suspect that she had this white heritage um but the fact that she did just kind of shows that it doesn't matter you know even what we look like doesn't tell you the story of, of our genetic um, background and there's and i've also seen the converse i've also seen um there was a talk show 
um, many years ago. I didn't watch the whole show because I don't watch talk shows. But um, again, I saw it on a YouTube video, and it was a guy who was actually a white supremacist, some old right, white guy right. who was actually a white supremacist, and he done a DNA a genetic test, and he was like, I think he was like seventy five percent African. Basically, he was like he genetically he was more a black man than he was a white man. But he looked like a white man. He thought he was a white man. He's same like much like the black lady who thought she was completely black. He thought he was completely white. His um, when he done a, a test on his genes, he found out that, it, that he was quite far from the truth. And it was quite funny because yeah, he, these are two people that both you know in different ways. I mean, you know, obviously the white person who was a white supremacist was a bit more of a nasty flavor of racial identitarianism than the black lady who wasn't necessarily hateful towards white people, but she just was very, um, yeah, she's still deriving pride yes, from she's something very invested that... in her identity. And she kind of brought, um, got her identity from this kind of racial group. And then she found out that she, that racial group wasn't really an accurate representation of her genetics, you know? So yeah, it, it shows, I mean, there's lots of reasons why racism stupid, but that's just another reason that we can add to the, to the already pretty long list is most of the rate, most of the people that are alive today aren't even really, um, genetic the, the the race that they identify isn't really their genetic story and we're all we're all just a mixture of various different genes throughout history um and we're all and that's again this is the other thing coming back to individualism it's not it's not it sounds cliche to say we're all individuals but it's true we are all individuals and, i mean even when you look at genetics that's a family thing you inherit your genetics from your family not your race one of the things I absolutely despise about Stefan Molyneux these days and his obsession with the area of race, where he likes to focus on like IQ trends and stuff like that. And he's trying to present it to people in a way of saying, well, OK, well, if you see a black person with a low IQ, that's because of his race and that's because of his genetics as a race. And I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute. If you have a, even if you accept that IQ was 100 percent genetic and it does appear to be largely genetic, but even if you accept that it's 100 percent genetic, it's still not a racial thing. It's a familial thing because you could take a black person that's got a low IQ and say, okay, he's got a low IQ because of his genetics. But then you could take a black person with a high IQ. If you want to pick a famous person, someone like Thomas Sal would be an obvious example. Mm, right. He's got high IQ because of his genetics and he's a black, you know what I mean? So it's like, it, it, it shows in my opinion that the genetic argument still isn't relevant to race anyway. You inherit your genetics from your family and there are plenty of, really intelligent white and black people and there are plenty of really stupid white and black people and their race has oh, very good yeah race. see it's such a loose correlation it's like yeah there may be a correlation and really who cares like i view it as just a trojan horse for people to to uh basically sneak in their their biases or their racism or whatever it may be it's like yes um if if what you really care about is intelligence, then why do you care at all about race? It's sort of like if I were to say, like, if I had a secret hatred of, like, um, I don't know, like, tall people, and it and maybe, like, 20% of tall people, like, wore a particular brand of shoe. So then I said, everybody who wears this shoe is, like, a rat bastard. But a lot of people who wear that shoe aren't tall, right? That's a really convoluted example. I shouldn't have made that. But the point is, like, just focus on the important trait if that's what concerns you so much. And yeah, don't... I understand what you're saying because it's like if you segregate, like, say for example, you segregated society by IQ, then that society wouldn't be racially segregated. Right, it would be IQ <laughs> segregated. There you go. It's, and even exactly. that, so it's not. It's, it shows that the two aren't the same thing. Like, if you segregated up. Um, society by race, which it has been in the past, obviously, or certain countries. Um, if you did that, then you're not going to have a, a society that's segregated by IQ. You're going to have a mixture. And if you segregate by IQ, then you're not going to have an IQ that's segregated by race. Again, you'll have a mixture. People could argue, oh, well, you might have a, a larger number of a particular race in this category and a lot and a smaller yeah, well, number in this category. But correlation. again, this is just coming into trends and and um, and averages, and it's not really relevant to to any any individual, as we say. Well, and and at the end of the day, I don't give a shit like so what someone's IQ is. If if that you know, I've seen very smart people who are very ineffective, uh, very lazy, have no principles, no work ethic, like a lot of the of my uh, role models 
uh, now that I've gotten a lot more into business, they're not, you know, incredibly intelligent people, but they have a wonderful attitude and work ethic. So what's important to me is your character, like, and, and the actions that you do. Like, it's so, so ridiculous to take pride in things that you have basically no control over. And that it's just a, it's, it's very lazy. Like, oh, look at me, look at, I, I won all of these things by a mistake, uh, you know, a random coincidence. I'm a lot more interested in what somebody has done with the card or with the hand that they've been dealt. And that's why I love individualism uh, and, you know, meritocracy of actions, because that it it cuts through all of the noise and all of the BS. And uh, to me, like, I, I just feel like uh, voluntarism and individualism in general, it's like such a breath of fresh air. It's like so refreshingly sane, you know, when compared to all of these insanities which people are so preoccupied with it and it all of these associations uh you know it, it doesn't do anything to help dissolve hatred and collectivism and group identity it's like look yeah you said yeah it's cliche but it's it's incredibly true and that's why it's cliche it's it's really funny that it has to be repeated is that we're all people and our rights come from being people not from being smart or not from being a certain race i mean you and i are probably preaching to the choir at this point uh most people believe completely in what we're saying it's really those vocal and insane you know minorities on the fringe of both the left and the right you know the racists of the left and the right um who unfortunately have done a lot to divide society and it, it only takes a small number of crazy people to to rip apart you know, the harmony and the love and cooperation that it really, I think, is the norm. You know, that's that's would be my hope, I, th I think. I, like yesterday, we were at the park and I saw I saw Asian people, I saw black people. Now I'm using those terms loosely because they were actually mixed, just like I'm mixed and my son is mixed. You know, I'm white, my wife is not white. Um, and we all got along and we all had a lot of fun and nobody had any property disputes and nobody was sitting there measuring their intelligence and they were we were all talking <laughs> together and being you know caring reasonable people and that that's why i'm starting to like the the term nations of sanity because that's what represents sane human interaction to me but come on guys can we get back to basics please yeah no i fully agree i mean and again i'd like to uh, echo your sentiment with regards to iq because there is a, it's so much more that makes up a person than iq um but even for people as i say even for people that do like to focus on specifics like that it still doesn't tie to race in the way that many people are starting to think you know like i say thanks to people like stefan molyneux who can push this kind of nonsense but but yeah um again that is that's the beauty of the non-aggression principle and the concept of self-ownership. It doesn't even have, it doesn't, because the thing is about self-ownership, it doesn't deal with race specifically. It doesn't address it, but it doesn't need to because it's exactly. self-evident that it doesn't exactly. matter. It's self-evident that you're an individual and the only thing that matters is your, is, well, like, you know, Martin Luther King used to say about the content of your character, um, which is obviously played out by your actions. And that's what the non-aggression principle obviously judges is your actions. Are you a peaceful individual who respects other people's rights to live as free as you are? Or are you a violent criminal who wants to aggress against people, rob them and violate them in, in various ways, you know? And and that is, um, going back to the nation's sanity, that's one of the things... That's one of the things that I think voluntarism looks to do, and that's certainly something that is a goal of the nations of sanity, is, um, again, I have an article on here that's called Unite and Divide. Um, and one of the points I make in there is, is, yes, I'm trying to unite people, or you know, and anyone who's sort of involved in voluntarism is trying to unite good people, people that can recognise the morality of the non-aggression principle, which you know should be pretty much everybody. And we're trying to unite good, peaceful people. But also, we're trying to divide um, people, but we're trying to divide people in a way that should be the division. In other words, we're trying to divide, um, separate the peaceful people who can respect each other from the people who, who want to violate your rights, who want to rule you, who want to rob you, who want to do all the rest of it. Um, so it's, for me, it's, it's important. 
it's, it's, it's about uniting and dividing. It's about drawing the line that says, you know, because the thing is, people can be different in all sorts of ways. And I'm not even saying people have to get together in, in all kinds of ways. People can still dislike each other and and want to associate or disassociate depending on all sorts of different subjective preferences that are personal to their own personal ideals. You know, that's fine. But there's one area, there's, there's one dividing line. There's only one dividing line that's actually not just worth fighting for, but that we actually have a moral right to fight for. And that is that line that separates non-aggression principle violations from, you know, peaceful interactions. Because, and, and again, and, and actually this comes on to another subject that I wanted to speak about, which was the issue of morality and the kind of subjective versus objective morality. Because I think it's very important for people when they understand the non-aggression principle to understand that the non-aggression principle doesn't deal with all morality what it deals with is just that objective form of morality that defines aggression or enforceable and, at least well yeah and well i wouldn't even say enforceable because um i mean enforceable from a moral point of view yes but not necessarily practical because there could be something that that's a violation non aggression principle but for whatever reasons it's it's impractical to enforce that um but, or, or at least very difficult to enforce it, but the moral point is still there. You know, like, basically, because um, the non-aggression principle basically says you can't initiate force against peaceful people, but you can use force to defend against acts of aggression. Mm -hmm. What that's basically saying is saying, this is the line when you can use force to stop people. If someone's doing something I disagree with, but they're not violating the non-aggression principle, then I can speak out against what they're doing. I can... Um, encourage them or discourage them in whatever direction I think is better but I can't use force to interfere with them if they're not violating non-aggression principle because from an objective point of view they're not actually aggressing against anybody so any force I used against them would be an initiation of force against a peaceful person um, whereas if they are um, violating the non-aggression principle or attempting or threatening to do so then I can use force to prevent them because then the force I'm using isn't an initiation the force against a peaceful person but rather an act of defense against an aggressive person and that's mm -hmm. that that's that objective distinction and i think it's an important point for two reasons one it's important for people to understand okay this is the line this is that line in the sand that i sort of speak about in part two that that is where you can go no further you know we might disagree with you before, long before you step over that line but when you actually step over that line that's when people can actually use force to stop you right but it's also important to understand it from the opposite kind of uh, perspective in regards to the fact that that doesn't mean we approve of everything that's not a violation of the non-aggression principle you know there's plenty of things that i disagree with on a moral level and if it, and certain behaviors that I would not want to associate with people that, you know, behaved in a certain way that doesn't necessarily violate the non-aggression principle, doesn't necessarily fit that objective definition of crime, but mm. is nonetheless something I find immoral due to my own personal sensibilities. Um, and that's, so that's why I think it's important because a lot of people seem to think that, um, advocates of the non-aggression principle literally advocate and approve everything that's not a violation of the non-aggression <laughs> exactly. principle. Exactly. Yep. And that's not yep. the case. We're just saying, no, you, we're just saying you can't use force to stop those things, but you can still encourage and discourage. And, you know, it would be nice if people were nice to each other and helped each other. I think that's a good thing. I think that's a virtuous thing to help each other. But it's not something I can force people to do. And if someone wants to be... Um, if someone wants to walk past people that need help without helping them, I don't think they're a particularly moral person, but they're not a criminal. They're not violating the non-aggression. They're not aggressing against anybody. There's no positive obligation for them to help people, even though I myself might have uh, a moral sensibility that that um, obliges me to, to to help somebody because that's what I think is the right thing to do. It's not that it doesn't fall into that objective line of, 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 of aggression. Yeah. And I think the point we can distill from all of this, like the difference between voluntarists and let's say, for example, like liberal statists, you know, people who believe that we need to have laws against, you know, saying racist things, you know, increasingly people uh, want to police free speech, uh, or people who want to force you to to have to pay for certain things. It's like, like you said just a moment ago, you and I are the types of people who would 
never be rude. Uh, you know, we're very charitable. We believe in helping people. However, however, it's still better to have a society where people have the right to make that choice because choice, choice is the very fabric of society and you cannot force the outcome. That's like people, that's like equality of outcome versus equality of rights. It's sort of like, it's counterintuitive. If you try to force an, uh, an outcome, like everybody has an equal amount of money, for example, you will not get that. You will just get, I mean, you might get everybody at an equal level, but everyone's going to be poor because you, to get to these ends, people have to get there naturally and organically. And another example would be like, your child, if you want them to succeed in life, you have to let them make mistakes. And in things just as simple as like uh, walking, like yesterday, my son was at uh, the store and he fell like three times. <laughs> and um, the thing is, I'm not going to catch him every single time he falls. Uh, I'm only going to catch him, you know, if he were to get seriously injured. But, you know, he, he uh, like cut his lip and he hit his head on a cardboard box and he was totally fine. And those experiences are going to help him learn to walk better. All of human progress is learning from failures, right? Like he, the human mind is a, a giant optimization machine. It's a, it's a neural network that figures out how to optimize based on inputs and outputs. And when you get an undesirable output, like when you do drugs, you know, your life tends to fall apart. When you uh, aren't charitable, you know, you experience a lot less uh, reward, you know, that, that sort of intangible, uh, you know, feeling of good of helping people. So all of these wonderful things that we like and would prefer people do, we have to allow those things to develop organically. And like you said, only once you reach a certain point, can you use force to say, okay, that's too much. Like a guy can be really rude to his server at a restaurant and be like, you know what, you, you bitch, you messed up my order. Like, you're so stupid. Like, that's not a crime. But if he takes his hot coffee and splashes it in her face, okay, that guy's getting his ass kicked out of the restaurant and criminal charges against him. So, yeah. Exactly. That's... And you can disagree with both behaviors, but only one of them was an actual act of aggression that you can use force to, to respond to. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree entirely. And, and I mean, the, the thing is that's important about it as well is it's, I mean, the, 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 the drug thing is a good example. You know, a lot of people that advocate for the end of drug laws are people that want specific drugs to be legalized. You know, obviously, uh, I myself was um, quite heavily involved in cannabis activism and trying to get that legalized for um, partly because of all the medicinal uh, benefits that it can give to people, but also just for the basic absurdity of a, cr of a law that says you're a criminal for for using it, even if it's just you using it for pleasure, you know. Um, but it's this, but but. I kind of um, evolved from that position to basically realizing that all drugs should be or shouldn't be illegal, at least, um, because, again, it, it falls back. on, And it doesn't mean that I think people should do all of these drugs. I mean, there's a lot of drugs that, are, you know, not all drugs are equal, but there's, you know, a lot of drugs. Are, uh, I would, you know, I wouldn't want anyone I cared about to, to do it. You know what I mean? It would be something I would discourage um anybody I cared about from doing and you know and they can destroy their lives not just with drugs with all sorts of things but you know drugs is an, is an obvious example but so when we advocate for an end to the drug laws we're not saying that we want people to do these drugs we're not even saying we think these drugs are a good idea or, or something that's beneficial to society we're simply saying that to criminalize the use of them is in itself a criminal act it is absurd on the face of it um, and it is an act of aggression against peaceful people no matter what um, else you can say about somebody's drug use what you cannot say is that that person is aggressing against anybody else or violating anybody else and if they want to ruin their own life then that is there, and uh, I'm sorry to interrupt but I, I just wanted to add on there are a lot of good things that come out of that right like you have to let people screw up their lives uh and uh, that will serve as an and as an example to other people too that's one thing people forget is like seeing a drug addict uh you know on the street nobody wants to see that nobody wants to watch their family uh member you know hit rock bottom but guess what 
that's going to send a very strong, powerful message to everybody else. And that's part of how we naturally evolve towards a better society, you know, is by trial and error. And if you just put a ban on something, you know, people are never going to figure it out on their own. Oh, for sure. And, 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 and passing those lessons on to others also means so much more when it comes from the mouth of somebody that's actually lived the experience, you know, um, which is why a lot of people that used to be drug addicts are involved in programs to either help other drug addicts or to even warn people from even going down that road in the first place. And their warnings mean a lot more because they they're speaking from actual lived experience and they can testify, you know, as opposed to some, know nothing prude who just disagrees with drugs and knows nothing about them and will just fear monger with a load of scare stories a lot of which people find out isn't true and i think that ends up damaging because then they think oh well if that's not true then probably even these other things that were warnings about the dangers of this drug might not be true as well and in anything they can end up inadvertently encouraging people when they're trying to discourage them because Mm -hmm. You know, there's been so many lies um, told about a lot of drugs that, that people just don't believe any of it anymore. And then when there is a, a legitimate cause for warning and a legitimate reason to say, well, you might not want to do that because of this, people are less inclined to believe it because they might just think it's part of the same propaganda as all the other lies were. So it it um, undermines their case massively as well. But, uh, but yeah, but also, like you say, that's part of life. And some of the most important lessons we can learn in life are through actual experience and are through like like with your son he the the lessons he learned from you know from from the injuries he caused from his fall because you know because they weren't too severe they were they were light enough they were they were enough to teach him a lesson and 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 but they were also light enough to obviously you know not be a big deal um and it's the same you know, i'm the same with my boy i try not to be too much of a helicopter parent hovering over him all the time but um because you do have to temper that you do have to let them do things themselves a bit if you do everything for them then they won't learn for themselves and and part of it's it's it's, it's a balance as a parent because you have to strike that balance you want to you want to be there for them and care for them. You, you don't want to obviously go the other extreme of neglecting them, but you don't want to do too much for them because that in itself can be harmful to them. You want them to, you know, you want to raise, if you love them, you want to raise them in a way that they can be um, a, a self-sufficient, um, empowered person and not someone that's just, you know, needs other people to do everything for them because they never learn themselves. So it's mm-hmm. an important balance to strike as a parent. Yep. It's, in society, I mean, we don't want everybody, every single person to have to hit rock bottom, you know, through a hero, heroin, you know, overdose or something. We do want to be efficient with the lessons we learn. But, um, you know, I would argue that that just allowing society to naturally evolve to that is is the best way, you know, rather than uh, bans. You know, people don't drink gasoline you know, we've learned our lesson pretty well on that. Uh, you know, not many people are huffing glue, and that's a good thing. But, you know, you do, the occasional reminder will happen. And uh, you're right, it, it's about balance. You don't want the cost to be so high, you know, staggeringly high. For example, you don't want your society to slip into war uh, just to remind people that war is bad, right? Because the cost is is absolutely, you know, tremendous. But God, it seems like um, it almost seems like people have to learn that lesson over and over. Not that they should. Uh, so yeah, I, I agree. It's. I think we we would both argue that the the best and most efficient way to encapsulate these lessons, uh, while not forgetting where they came from in the first place, is to allow society to evolve naturally. For sure. And it's like, I mean, we had an epidemic in the 80s in England of, of people sniffing glue as a, as a you know, as a, as a sort of alternative drug use. And, you know, you, you don't need to make glue illegal to stop people from doing that. You just need to educate them as to the sort of damage they're doing themselves doing that. You don't need to infringe on their right to do it. If they, Like you say, if someone wants to drink gasoline, that is their right as a self-owning person. I, I often say a similar thing. I use the example of bleach. I say if someone wants to drink bleach, that's their free choice. You know, it's, it's not advisable you might want to give them a few reasons why they don't want it why they might not want to do it and and you know and encourage or discourage them but at the end of the day as a self-owning adult they can they can do that to the detriment of themselves um it's as soon as they start trying to force it onto somebody else that's when obviously it becomes an issue um but all the time it's their own free choice and they'll make those mistakes 
Um, and as you say, it, sometimes people will learn better. And, I'll, and even if, you know, they might learn and other people might learn from their experiences. Um, sometimes, sometimes we can know things intellectually and that's sufficient. Sometimes we can know things, but... Um, oh, still do it. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes... There's, I say, I kind of say there's knowing and there's knowing. There's knowing that you know in an intellectual level, but until you've actually gone through the experience, oh you, then yeah. you know it in a different level. You know, How you, many you people know, the... know what it takes to be healthy and still don't do it, right? Yeah. That, that's a perfect example, is people know what it takes to extend their life by 10 or 20, 30 years, but they still don't do it, and that's okay. That is their right. It's part of life. If you want to be sedentary, if you want to eat sweets and garbage and y'all, that we, you and I, and pretty much everybody understands that having a ban on, you know, like being lazy, having a ban on certain foods, it would never work, right? That's the point. Yes, like we may have rules for ourselves, but we cannot impose those rules on other people. Even if, even if you had like total control and you had like the most authoritarian abilities, like godlike abilities, like you could turn society into a prison and you still wouldn't even be able to control people because you can't keep drugs out of prisons, the most <laughs> secure place in the world, supposedly. So the idea that even if you had the ability to control these substances uh, or behaviors, you never will. It's just, it's, it's both morally uh, wrong and it's, it's practically impossible in, in implementation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, like you say, it's it's morally wrong, and it just wouldn't it wouldn't be feasible. It wouldn't be practical. And also, once you set that precedent, once you sort of say, "Oh, well, we can ban this because it's you know bad for people, and we're taking that control over their lives," like you say, where does it end? Once you set that precedent, you might as well outlaw sedentary lifestyles, unhealthy food, high sugar food, fast you know, so many things, any dangerous activity. You can't go bungee jumping. You can't ride a motorcycle. People shouldn't even be allowed to drive car. You know, it, it never ends. Once you get into that precedent of protecting people from themselves and in interfering yeah. with their basic freedom to live, um, once you go into that kind of level, there really is no end to it. And and because it's such a subjective standard as well over what's good for your life, you know, who's to say what is a better life, you know, and all of that, you know, it, again, that, that, oh, again, that's just going back to the beauty of the non-aggression principle, that objective standard of actually, you've actually got to be aggressing, you've actually got to be violating another person to be, you know, to be doing something that warrants force used against you. Um, so yeah, uh, like I said, I think that's an important point because I think it's something that a lot of people miss. Uh, often I hear people that are critical of voluntarists or you know or this 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 kind of anarchism or advocates of the non-aggression principle. People that are critical of it often try to uh, straw man you in the sense that of saying, "Oh, well, you just that means that you agree with everything that's not a violation of the non-aggression principle." And it's like, no, it's not about that. We all have our own personal uh, ideals and sensibilities and moralities and it's not you know i don't agree with everything that's not a crime but i'm just recognizing that it, what what is and isn't a crime you know and that doesn't mean that i agree with everything that's not a crime it just means i understand that i can't use force to stop behaviors that i disagree with on a more subjective level yeah i guess i'll, I'll just give one i think it's a pretty powerful example but there was a guy named dan osman he was a climber and he did these extreme like speed climbs with no equipment and like it's like terrifying stuff uh i would never do that i would never advise anyone to do that obviously but the guy clearly was like high on life he he loved it it was his life climbing rocks mountains that was his passion and he he lived a very you know thrilling and rewarding life but he died uh eventually from this like he fell down a mountain and died predictably does that mean that we would have had the right to, to force this man not to do that, even on his fatal climb? The answer is no, because value is subjective. And you know what? He probably, I, in fact, before he died, he said, I think he said, like, if I die doing this, like, I'll die happy. Maybe that's inaccurate, but I, I remember hearing that. The point being, you know, part of life is the pursuit of happiness. And that's why we have this thing in American history called the pursuit of happiness is we don't say the pursuit of like 
safety or you know the the guarantee of safety but no the pursuit of happiness you know the risk this is this is living and people like that that's part of what makes life enjoyable is having this adventure and and doing what you want and it doesn't always work out for everybody but you know what that's that is part of life life is not perfect uh you know just look at the animal kingdom you know they're eating people not people they're eating each other and fighting for survival you know we are a far cry from that thankfully uh because of these constructs that we've created like rights and property and things like that but um you can't you can't impose a nanny state uh and, and even if you did you know you'd sap the the life and the happiness and the joy out of everybody as you see in all of these communist countries you know people come people it produces joyless uh robotic people yeah and i i like i one of the things i like about that pursuit of happiness thing as well is that it's the pursuit of happiness that you have a right to. Like, you don't have a right to be happy because, for one thing, no one could provide that right to you and, and, and actualize that for you for various <laughs> reasons. Um, but I like the fact that that's what it is. It's, it's, you have the right to pursue happiness in however way you see fit, as long as you're not violating another person's right to do the exact same thing. And that's what I like about the phrase pursuit of happiness. It's not saying you have a right to be happy. It's not saying you have a right to this, that, or the other. It's just saying you have a right to pursue happiness, which is kind of another way of saying you have the right to live your life the way you see fit. <laughs> do whatever the hell you want. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly. Also, um, t- talking about that guy um, on the on the mountain kind of reminded me of the issue of euthanasia which again mm. is an area that the non-aggression principle has a has a pretty clear um, stance on, which is, again, it's your right. As a self-owning individual, you have the right to do with your own body what you wish, as long as you don't harm others. And that does include ending your own life. Now, there's obviously a lot of caveats that need to be put with that with regards to that that means that it needs to actually be your decision. And obviously, we would in, in, in a real world, we would want to guard against... Um, you know, abuses of, of, of that freedom in, with regards to, you know, people say, well, what about some family member who just wants their old parents to die for some horrible reason and, 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 and you know, and all of that. It's like, well, you know, and, and, and tries to uh, manipulate them into something like that. And it's like, well, obviously you need to guard against it to make sure it is a free decision like you would need to with any kind of um, agreement, although obviously the stakes are a bit higher when it comes to life or death. Um, but the basic principle is clear. And again, that just comes back to that issue we were talking about earlier with, the, with regards to the fact that grey areas over exactly where you draw lines in certain kind of areas of minutia don't invalidate the principle. And as a matter of principle, the non-aggression principle allows you to kill yourself if that's genuinely what you want to do. Um, <laughs> as, as, I know it's a bit of a morbid th- point to make, but it's 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 another thing that becomes self-evident. Once you accept self-ownership, a lot of these things become self-evident, and you almost don't need to discuss. Um, once you accept self-ownership, you don't need to discuss drug use or racism or the right to die or any of these things because they become self-evident. You own yourself. Doesn't matter what your race is, you have the same rights as anybody else. You own yourself. Doesn't matter what you want to do with your body, up to and including killing yourself, which, you know, as horrible as that is, that is your right. You own yourself. You have right over yourself and only yourself. And one other little quick point I'd like to make, which just sort of strikes back to the objective nature of this, because um, I don't know if you're familiar with the channel Disenthrall. Um, which is another voluntarist channel, a guy called Patrick Smith runs it. It's a great channel and, and he's a good guy. Um, but I, we have a few disagreements on a few areas. And one of the areas he, we disagree a little bit is how he defines rights. Um, he kind of defines it as part of a, as part of a, um, a, a mutual uh, contractual agreement. Like, you know, you have the right to not be harmed because you agree not to harm others kind of thing. And I don't I don't think that's quite accurate, although I can see where it's coming from. I actually think rights comes from an objective fact that, like, um, basically, my, this is my train of logic on it, is as a simple matter of fact, you are you. I know that sounds redundant, but just to get us started with the ball rolling of where this premise comes from, you are you as an objective fact. And from there, it's not too much of a leap to say you have self-ownership because 
by the simple fact that you are you means that you control you, you have right over you. You could just are you, then you have right over you. Um, and then from that premise of self-ownership, the non-aggression principle becomes an objective standard morality because once you accept that you own yourself, once you accept that people own themselves, then a, um, any violation of that self-ownership, any act of aggression is objectively a violation of your self-ownership you know like if, if someone um, assaults you or, or rapes you or murders you or, or robs you they've violated your self-ownership in an objective way you know so I, I think that's a side I think that's a kind of uh, an objective grounding for how we describe rights and that's why um, I, I've heard the term negative rights ascribed to what the non-aggression principle represents that's why you can only have negative rights because you only have right over yourself and any other any of these positive rights when you say oh well i have the right to health care or i have the right to home or all these things that I'm not saying people shouldn't have these things and i do think we should make effort to you know um to make sure people don't go without certain basics i don't want people suffering and all the rest of it but they don't have a right to it and i always take issue with you know particularly left-leaning friends of mine that say oh you know health care is a right i'm like well it's not it's not a right, because if it was a right, then that means people are obliged to provide that right. And then if you then oblige people to provide that right, then you're interfering with their own individual rights as self-owning individuals. When you say, when you talk about negative rights, when I say, well, I have the right not to be assaulted by you, the only obligation on you is not to assault me. You know, it's not, you don't have to do anything for me. You don't have to provide me with anything. There's no positive obligation. There's only the negative obligation of leave me alone. You know, so um, that's kind of my wishy-washy way of uh, describing my view on rights. <laughs> well, here's a question. What do you think about the idea that somebody in a sense, gives up their right once they have violated the rights of others. Like, for example, let's say, let's say that uh, somebody robs a bank um, or they steal something. They steal your car. Here's a good example. A guy steals your car and he, it has your iPhone in his car and he parks it in his garage and you use the tracking app and you're like, yep, my car and my phone are in this guy's garage. Do you then have the right to... Uh, you know, break into his garage, open the door, drive out, you know, possibly damaging his house in the process. I would say yes, because he has violated your property. He's essentially given up his own property rights and his right to privacy and, you know, whatever rights he may have uh, that are required to, um, let's just say that he's now obligated to, to make restitution and, you know, whatever that takes your rights take priority over his because because he violated yours and he trampled your rights to obtain that car and that car is not legitimately his and even if he wants to you know store that in his, in his garage he's going to do so at his own peril his garage may get destroyed in the process like that sort of intuitively i'm trying to sort of apply a principle to to what i feel is intuitively right and i'm curious how you would how you would describe that in a more academic kind of sense. Yeah, well, there's basically two points there. One is obviously it's your property, so you have the right to recover it because it's your property. Now, that might involve certain other aspects, like you say, trespassing on his property and what have you, or any other force that's involved in doing so, um, which isn't in itself just getting your property back, although it, it's required to get your property back. But the other thing that's worth noting is the force you use is not an initiation of force against a peaceful person anymore you know this is the thing that people always need to remember with the non-aggression principle it doesn't prohibit force it prohibits the initiation of force now if you're if someone violates the non-aggression principle the reason you can use force against them is because the force you're using is not an initiation of force against a peaceful person but rather an act of defense or an act of or a response to their aggression which basically makes it defensive so in the more specific example that you gave of where you would actually have to break into their property to recover your um, stolen property, that's that's all. And again, we are having to use that rash, um, that kind of standard of rationality when we talk about what what is and isn't reasonable force and what is and isn't proportion proportional to the um, to the um, 
to the aggression that's been made against you. You know, like, for example, if, if someone stole five pounds off me, I can't kidnap and torture them for three days. That wouldn't be a proportional response, you know. So there is still a there is still rationality that comes into play when we're dealing with proportion. But the basic principle of the fact that you're allowed to use force in response to a non-aggression principle violation is basically comes from the fact that the force you're using is not an initiation of force. Somebody already initiated right. force against you when they robbed you, and all you're doing is acting against that initiation, which basically makes it an act of defense. Does that make sense? Is there, what if somebody refuses to give up, you know, what they have stolen? For example, let's say someone steals your cell phone and under, like, under no limit or point is he relinquishing that. Do you have the right to escalate force even up to the point where he could get injured beyond the value of the cell phone? Like, like maybe it require or like driving off with somebody's like luxury car. Can you like shoot them? Uh, n maybe not to kill them, but it's going to injure them and it could cost, you know, a massive medical bill, which costs a lot more than the car and it could possibly kill them. Like, do you think it's reasonable um, to escalate force even beyond the cost of the violation? Well, I mean, again, there is a certain level of, you know, people have to be reasonable and rational with regards to sort of certain standards. But, but with regards to dealing with the objective principles that come into play here, there's a certain, there's a few caveats that needed to be added. But generally speaking, you can use force to recover, and any any escalation of force, like for example, if you're trying to recover stolen property and the person's not giving it up, they're escalating it, not you, because mm, interesting. they're the one. Do you see what I mean? They're the ones that are continuing the act of aggression by continuing. They're trying to maintain that theft. You're acting to um, undo a crime or prevent a crime, and they're acting to further a crime. So the escalation of that issue is their fault, not yours, if that makes sense. That um, is, makes perfect sense, actually. But also, the other issue, the, the, the thing that you want to, like, if you want to sort of um, go the other way and sort of temper people going over the top with their responses, it's also important to remember, like I say, you know, um, and I use the extreme example of, oh, someone robbed a fiver off me, so I kidnapped them and tortured them for three days. That's obvious. But that's, I just use that. It's an extreme example, but I use it because it's so obvious that it's disproportionate. And as I say, when you get into more minutia, it does get into an area where reasonable people could disagree to a certain degree degree which is why i think we need this lines in the sand thing in in part two of my peace agreement to to draw the lines of where we you know draw the limits of people stretching things like that but basically like say for example someone stole your car and you started wildly shooting at them if you did if if what about all the other people you're endangering when you shoot the innocent people that had no part you know this is the thing like i couldn't i couldn't just start firing a gun at someone driving down the street when there's other people on the street that could get hit by those bullets that had nothing to do, you know, I, because then all of a sudden I'm endangering other people that had nothing to do with, um, you know, stealing my car. So I'm then initiating force against peaceful people, you know? So, so for one thing, your, your response would have to be um, focused only on the person that actually, you know, aggressed against you. You can't, then um, let, and and this is why wars are so immoral because it's like even if people can even if um, someone could say well you know this this government of this nation um, you know has acted aggressively against us and we have a right even if you can determine that you have a right to act against another nation's government that doesn't necessarily mean you have the right to bomb the hell out of all the innocent people that live within that nation and under that government's rule and that's one of the immoralities of rule and the whole. Um, one of the things that's so absurd and despicable about uh, this collateral damage that we seem to just accept with war is the killing of innocent people, people that had nothing to do with the, the act of aggression. So even if you feel like the response that you give is um, proportionate to the person you're responding to, if you start harming bystanders and innocent onlookers, then all of a sudden you're violating the aggression principle again. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that does make a lot of sense. And I think that I think that matters of practicality uh, and, you know, market driven, uh, what is the word market driven uh, measured response would come into play long before we get into have even having to answer these questions, right? Like when you're dealing with 
professional entities in particular, um, people, they, they're just going to let the theft go, right? Like Walmart, for example, is not going to like run over a candy thief with their security car. They don't even care about the philosophy of it. They care about the PR of it. Right? So, yeah. But it's yeah. important to understand there is a there is a proportional limit to what they can do, you know. And um, although the I know the problem with talking about proportionality is um, anyone who loves the objective nature of the non-aggression principle might complain that you're kind of compromising its objective nature by talking about something as subjective as potentially subjective as proportionality. But again, I think within reasonable standards, the again again this is why this whole drawing the black and white lines is so important because we can acknowledge gray areas but the reason why we need to draw lines for the black and white and say okay well this is where you're definitely violating non-aggression principle is because it's important to we can acknowledge that gray areas exist but we mustn't let those gray areas infect the black and white we must not let reasonable areas for reasonable people to disagree over differing interpretations to to allow people to stretch interpretations into absurdities just to re-invoke that metaphor about the desert and the grassland we can't let somebody use the fact that there is this little area in between that's hard to define ex let, allow them to walk right into the desert and call it the grassland or vice versa you know so there is a certain level of um, proportionality and there is a certain level of rationality that needs to come into it. You know, the non-aggression principle is objective, but we do need to be rational um, to a certain extent with regards to um, some of this minutia. I mean, just to give you a real extreme example, which I think, and I always, it's an extreme example, but it's also a simplified example. And I often like to simplify things. I think like when we spoke last time, we were often talking about, you know, what you do about past theft with regards to, you know, like um, all of the, violent conquest that has gone on in our history to attain so much property and resources you know what do you do about that when when do you say what well, we're drawing a line under it and moving on and when do you say well actually this needs to be returned to this person all the rest of it and i think when we had that conversation we used the example we simplified it down to the example of someone stealing your bike and it's like okay well if someone stole your bike and then sold it onto a third party you can um take that um, bike back from the third party because it's your property. They don't have a right to it. But it's also important to understand that that third party wasn't the aggressor, um, the person in between who stole it from you and then sold it to the third party as the aggressor because they, they aggressed against you by stealing your bike and then they aggressed against the third party by essentially stealing their money because they sold them a bike that they didn't actually have a right to sell, you know, stuff like that. And we use that as an example of, well, that's an area where if that applied to like, the historical context of property we could um right those wrongs but what if again using the bike example what if someone stole your bike and then sold it on to somebody who then sold it on to somebody else and by this point the people that are selling on had no knowledge of its original or nothing to do with the original theft and then generations go by because you died and and the 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 um the bike can no longer be traced back to you and you know and and, and you have that that, that the, this this degree of separation where the rightful owner is no longer around to claim that bike because it they're no longer there and the person who stole it is no longer around to to you know to take compensation from or whatever and all you have left is voluntary trades basically you have to admit that those people are the right owners because they voluntarily traded it from somebody else who voluntarily traded it from somebody else who voluntarily traded it and even if it was going way back originally stolen the original owner of that is no longer around to compensate the original thief is no longer around to punish all you have between um all you have is voluntary transactions which you know and again, for anyone listening to this, rightful ownership, according to the non-aggression principle, is acquired through creation of voluntary trade. So it is yours rightfully. And I just, um, I forgot why I was actually talking about that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I lose my thread. <laughs> yeah, it's just another example of like, at some point, ju you know, perfect justice becomes impossible. And, and we can't really lose too much sleep over that, I think, in the end. Yeah, and oh shit, that uh, reminds me of what I, why I went on that little tangent was um, again. It's, I like to s simplify um, things to just to kind of make the principle more clear and then re-extrapolate it. And just going to the thing of sort of like wars and collateral damage because I ha remember having this conversation with somebody and they kind of put it to me 
well, like, you know, well, what is someone, you know, if you're being, should you just let yourself die under attack because you don't want to retaliate because your retaliation might hit an innocent person? And I kind of um, simplified that to the example of, okay, say, imagine there's somebody that's shooting at you and you've got a gun so you can shoot back, but that person is using an innocent person as a shield. Mm -hmm. So they're shooting at you. And if you don't shoot back, they're going to kill you. They, you know, they've missed you a few times, but they're still shooting at you, and they're trying to kill you. And your only hope is to shoot back and try and kill them. But there's a chance you might kill the innocent person they're holding. Right. In that in that situation, you would be allowed to act to defend your own life. And although the innocent person shouldn't be killed because of this the person that's responsible for them if they do get killed is not you but the person that's shooting at you and using them as a shield because they're creating that situation and you're not expected to um you know kill yourself to save another person you just can't you know so so if you're in that or or, or another example just to sort of illustrate the same point if someone put a gun to your head and said shoot this other person right 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 if you're a brave person, and I'd certainly like to think that I would still refuse and just say, well, shoot me, I'm still not doing it. But if you're not that brave person, you're not a criminal. The person that killed that person is the person who put the gun to your head, not you, you know? Um, and again, this is an area where, from my own personal ideals, I would like to think that I would have the courage to, to still refuse and to take the bullet to my own head rather than take an innocent life. But the fact of the matter is, if I didn't have that courage, the criminal, the, the the criminal isn't me. It's the person that's made, you know, that's put the gun to my head and made me do it. But you, it would have to be that level of duress that you're under. You'd have to be under that level of duress. And any other time, you know, if you if you harm an innocent person, then you're you're guilty of aggressing against them. So, yeah, um, does, I, yeah. I agree. People aren't responsible for what they do, you know, when they're when they are being aggressed against themselves. I, I totally agree with that. Um, there's a few other points I want to talk about, but I know our time's sort of running low, so maybe we'll um, perhaps wrap this conversation up, um, but perhaps put a pin in it and maybe have a, a, a part two um, later a lot later on. Yeah, I, we can talk about you know maybe one more if you want, or we can save them all uh, for another longer one. It, it doesn't matter. I've got maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Um, well, the only reason I was thinking because a lot of the things I was looking at, I think they're all going to be quite lengthy <laughs> conversations. Yeah, and, and yeah. Things I... I'd like to get into in a bit more. Me I mean, for example, I'd like to speak about the issue of environmental protection. Mm, and yeah. I also want to speak about land ownership with you because I've got what potentially might be a unique take on land ownership. Um, I would love to. How, yeah. And how it ties to property rights. But I think it's a longer conversation than 10 minutes. So. Um, perhaps we'll wrap the conversation up now, but if you're up for having another conversation in the future, um, we can perhaps sort of, um, you know, get onto some of these other. Those, in fact, land ownership, um, land ownership of, of all topics is one of the most interesting to me, especially in the last like two years, as I've been, you and I both have been very like entrenched in these debates with communists and a lot of, lefty anarchist type people if you want to call them that and ownership of land is one of the one of those areas that's actually quite a hot topic and not quite as cut and dry as a lot of anarcho capitalists would like it to be myself included so i think it's an, an extremely important discussion and yeah let's let's have a dedicated talk where we focus a little more on land i think that deserves a talk of its own Okay, well, I'll tell you what, then perhaps we'll arrange that and, like I say, make the subject specifically about that. Um, it might tie to things like environmental um, right, aspects right. and things like that and, and general property rights. But, yeah, if we, if, if you're up for doing another conversation, then we'll try to focus specifically on that so we can really get into the meat of it and really, you know, re really get into a more sophisticated conversation than we would have in sort of five, ten minutes. So, um, yeah, if you're up for that, I'd love to have, speak about that in more detail. And, what I might do beforehand as well, I might send you a little message outlining my kind of my stance on it, just so you can sort of mull over it before we do speak again. Um, and perhaps we'll arrange another conversation if you're up for it. Yeah, please do. That sounds great. Okay, it's great. Okay, well, well I'm going to let you go, Dan. Um, we've spoken for about an hour and a half. Um, and um, like I say, we haven't got much longer. 
So I think we'd best leave the rest of it for another conversation. But I really appreciate you taking the time. Just like our other conversation, I really enjoyed it and I found it interesting. And I think it's important to have these conversations and go through this because there's a lot of topics here that that need addressing um, and mm. need clarifying. And um, I appreciate you taking the time. Oh, my pleasure. I, I, I always enjoy speaking with you, Matt, particularly because you have a very reasonable stance and not only is it reasonable, but it's rooted in like defensible philosophy. And, you know, that's one area of danger you get with people who become ideologues who, who don't, you know, they, they forget that the other side has some merit. And I think we'll really get into that with the land ownership discussion. Like you and I agreed a lot here and we will agree most likely on the land topic, but not with, all other anarcho-capitalists or even voluntarists, I think. Uh, there are definitely areas where, um, you know, you can't have absolute pure, you know, monopolistic control over everything. See, now I'm just giving a spoiler of the next conversation. But yeah. What I'm Hello? Hello? I think you might have muted yourself, Dan, because I can't hear you anymore. Hello. Sharing in society and, and not being basically a selfish bastard. So sorry, then, stuff, can you did you can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Yeah, yeah, sorry, you cut out then. I don't know if you accidentally muted your mic or something, but you cut out then so I didn't hear anything you just said. <laughs> oh damn. Get well, if you can hear me now, basically I what can I hear you now, you go. Okay, sorry about all that. What I was saying was just that I think you have an extremely, you know, reasonable viewpoint. And it's very well tempered by both sides. And that's what I really appreciate about our conversations is we can really appeal to the everyday person who who wants freedom, but recognizes that there are, you know, real world implications. There are real people who are born into poverty. There are less privileged people. And, you know, how can we create both a free society and a society that doesn't neglect, you know, the least of these, so to speak? So we'll get it more into that in our next call. But Always a pleasure, Matt, and always willing to have a talk. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dan. And like I said, I really appreciate it. And, and I enjoy these conversations as well because one of the great things about speaking with, with somebody else who um, you're already on the same page with with regards to the, the principle of self-ownership and the non-aggression principle is because we're already on the same principle and working on the same principle, we're able to talk about these areas where we, you know, I mean, we've, we've got that common ground that we can talk about these areas um, and, and, and discuss these minutiae in, 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 a, in a better detail. And we don't have to keep circling back to issues like arguing over whether the taxation's theft and stuff like that, you know, because we're, we're agreed on the basic principle and that, and that means that we can kind of explore these more specific areas because um, we're exploring them based on the same principle. And we're just, you know, we're saying, right, okay, well, let's look at how this principle applies in this situation. So I think it's a really... A uh, really interesting conversation to have and also a really important conversation to have. So, like I say, I really appreciate you taking the time. And I look forward to speaking to you again about uh, land ownership and the environment and stuff like that. So uh, we'll have to get in our diaries out and organize that. All right. We'll see you later, Matt. Bye. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it.